you can design a good circuit, right? So why do we do analog circuits? Why are we all talk, talking about digital circuit? It's correct, digital circuit is everywhere because it is very resilient to noise. When you're talking about analogs, the absolute value is very important, right? But for digital circuit, even you have noise, the circuit is so-called regenerative. It can bring me back to zero and one. So I can design a, a circuit with one billion transistor without problem if it is digital because it's very resilient to noise. And it also uh, can, uh, I can use computer to help me to generate the circuit easily. But analog circuit is still very important because we are analog, right? We don't do digital. Uh, everything, our feeling, right? The temperature, the sensing, the pressure, they are all analog. So we always need to do some conversion from analog to digital or digital to analog. So ADC, DAC, which refers to, for example, the analog, right? to digital converter. This is just an example, right? The ADC, for example, is a big field. Some people just uh, earn their living by just doing DAC in a company and they buy two houses in Silicon Valley or whatever, right? Just because they're expert in DAC, because this is ADC and DAC, they're difficult, very difficult, right? Uh, so, we do need analog. Another thing is we are in a highly connected world, right? IoT, Internet of Things, right? All this, we also need to interact with the analog world, right? I always imagine in the future, uh, every piece of wood in your house or brick in your house probably have an IC chip, but it's very, very low cost, right? We make it very low cost, maybe 0 0.01 cents. And it's going to just sense the humidity, right? And uh, every two months send you a signal, tell you whether humidity uh, is good or bad. Then you know whether there may be termite or whatever. Isn't that great? And then you can just replace it, you know, exactly which wood has problem, right? So all this, and nowadays IoT is so important, right? Uh, it was a high, but it's really happening. I, I really think that this table will have a few chips in the future because it's cheaper than without the chip, right? I, I can keep maintaining it for one, I can keep using it for 100 years until the chip tell me that, oh, it's going to break tomorrow based on my measurement today, right? Another thing now are they making uh, uh, analog very important is so-called neuromorphic computing, right? Machine learning is very important. We know that, right? But in machine learning, if some of you have, not, have learned it from other classes, you know that it does a lot of uh, matrix multiplication and then addition and then accumulation. Basically, it's just doing a very huge matrix multi multiplication for a neural network. So that consumes a lot of energy. And um, I don't know, like the uh, chat GPT, probably some of you are using already for your homework. <laughs> it's pretty good. Right? <laughs> but um, I don't know if they disclose how much uh, energy they use to train that machine. That must maybe just, uh, that must be humongous. Maybe like the energy need to power up the whole, whole time. That is possible, right? So nowadays people talk about, how do you reduce the energy for machine learning? And particularly the edge device. So what is the edge device? Those what you are holding on your hand, the cell phone or, uh, or um, your eye watch, right? They cameras, yeah, security cameras. Or, or even can we do machine learning in, on IoT? People are doing that also. You don't want to power those devices or you can only supply very low power to them, maybe full RF charging, micro microwave charging, right? So one way to reduce the power consumption is to use something like this. This is a, a array. You see, this is just a resistor. And then what is the current going through this resistor? It just follow the Ohm's law. I equals to V divided by R. So this is I. And this I is going to come here. This is I1. This is I2, right? And then eventually you will get a summation of the I, right? And this I are just equals to V in VI times, instead of, call it, instead of resistor, I call it conductance, GI. 
This is, I don't go to the detail, this is just a matrix multiplication. So I can do the matrix multiplication just by using a very simple analog circuit. And each of these resistors is so-called emerging memory, like resistive memory, ferroelectric memory. I can program them so they have the correct weight, the correct conductance to do the matrix multiplication I want. I can do this in one shot. That saves a lot of energy uh, for data transfer and also speed up a lot. Right? And I need to do what? Comparison, amplification, and then analog to digital conversion, right? So analog circuit definitely will be there forever, right? Uh, in, a, in, in an Intel chip, yeah, maybe one billion of the transistors are for digital, but you still have uh, maybe a few hundred, a few thousand of those critical ones for analog. Without those, your chip is not going to work. For example, voltage reference. In a chip, you always need a voltage reference or current source that you, it is insensitive to the environment. And those are very important. We'll dis discuss some of them in the future. Okay, so that's why you want to do analog. Now then in this class, what do you expect after this class, right? Here I show you a circuit. Some of you might already understand what it is. It's a differential amplifier. We will go into details. If I ask you, this is the input we in one we in two. I have a differential input. What output am I going to get? How would you solve it? Right? Many of you will say, ah, oh, because you have learned a advanced skill, you will say, well, I have one, two, three, four, five, six, eight transistor. I have two resistor. I have one current source. Let me just write down the KCL, KVL and solve it. And I'm very uh, careful. After 24 hours, I will give you the answer, right? For me, I will give up in six hours and the answer will still be wrong, right? So you don't want that. Of course, you can say, let's ask the computer to do it, definitely. But however, you don't have the insights. The computer tell you what the gain is. But then the problem is, you don't know what is the role of R1 and R2. And in the meeting with your VP, your VP say, oh, our, our course is... Uh, uh, getting too much, we cannot compete with, with another company. Can you make the area smaller? Uh, for example, can you make M1 and M2 smaller so we meet the target? And you say, okay, let me go back to do the simulation again, right? You lose the opportunity. But if you have insights, you probably can tell the VP right away. Well, reducing M1, what do you want to reduce? The width or the gate length? Well, you reduce the width, maybe the GM is reduced, but then the gain will be lower. We cannot achieve that certain goal, right? So this type of insight is like what I'm saying here, the experience intuition. And that is what I would like to uh, learn with you in this class, okay? To gain a certain of such insights. For example, looking at this, I already know that in EE124, that is this class, right? The gain is going to be negative capital GM times R out. What is capital GM? I know every circus must be the overall transconductance times the overall output impedance. You are going to learn this, how to find the overall transconductance. But I already know what the gain is negative capital GM alpha. Now, I also know that this is a differential pair, differential circuit, and I'm working on small signal. And I'm also told that this is an absolutely symmetric circuit. And because of this, I'm going to use a concept called virtual ground that you will learn later. And also plus the half circuit technique to help me, help me to simplify this circuit. So I dare to just cut this circuit into half and then I'm going to grind this guy. Okay, you don't know why, but after this class, I am very confident I'm doing the right thing. Okay, I can use virtual grind. That is what I'm doing here, virtual grind. I use half circuit. I even not going to look at the other half because the result will be correct. Then I looked at this circuit. I see the input it is here. The output is here, and I have a transistor on top of me. Okay, this is a Cusco circuit. It's not the common source I have learned. No problem. 
I already know that the Costco circuit will give me the overall GM approximately equals to GM1. It is just the small signal GM transconductance, right? You will learn that. And for GM1 from E128 or this class, we'll talk again, what is the meaning of transconductance? Is how much drain current you will get by changing the gate voltage a little bit right? for every unit change of the uh, gate voltage. And then how do I find the R out? Well, R out basically is saying that I want to look into here and then I want to know what is the output impedance. Well, just that I have two paths. One is going up. I call it R up. Another is going down. This R down, right? So R out must be equals to R up parallel R down. Right? We know that already. And I learned that I also practice my skills so well that I know that when I'm doing this output impedance, I need to ground the input. Later you will understand, appreciate more why I need to ground the input. I will ground all those current source. So this becomes the output impedance of a Casco circuit or equivalently a common source with degeneration, right? You don't know why I'm talking about much. But I know this is equals to RO3, GM3, RO1, approximately. For the R down, right? Actually, I should write the R up first. And for R up, it is equals to RO5, times GM5 times R07, right? And then the whole thing just in parallel, okay? You don't need to read it, uh, it's ugly, right? But this is just to show you. Great. Good point. How about R1? And then now your VP discovered that, hey, we still have an R1. We do not intend to have R1. We make a mistake in the fabrication. Somehow there's an R1, right? So then you will say, oh, how do I account for this? Now, if you have insights, you already know that the so-called R5, R05, is actually can be modeled as a resistor across this terminal. So then you say, if I try to solve the KCL, KVL again, the equation, the solution will be the same, except that I just need to replace R5, okay, so this is 5, this is 5. Excellent, yeah. So this is 5, right? So I need to replace this guy by R5 parallel R1, okay? So with this, within a few minutes, you see that for this complicated circuit, I already show you what the gain is. It is equal to this whole thing, times small gm1 now then if you say that you want to change the width i know gm1 is going to change accordingly then i know what happened to the game right exactly so this is what i want you to learn in this class okay so but before that we we cannot be hand waving we will go through some rigorous derivation K, kcl kvl and with that our goal is to map uh, whatever you see in the future to what you already know before. If you can map them, you can use the equation you already know. If you cannot, then you need to do KCL and KVL. Okay? So that is our goal for this semester. Of course, we then will go to frequency response and also feedback. Okay? Any questions? <laughs>